So we got a lot to talk about today. That's we right. have a great pay-per-view coming up, the much-anticipated Noche UFC, oh, UFC yeah. 306. We're going to get into the main event, co-main event. Sean O'Malley, Marab Dvalish, Willie, the odds have this just about as close as it could possibly be. Yep. Same thing for the co-main. You know, Val and, and Alexa, they have put on two great performances thus far. Alexa's gotten her hand raised in both of them, but Valentina strongly contested that second matchup. Sure. She's going to be looking at 36 six years old now to get that belt one more time and have one last title reign also want to touch on the jiu-jitsu matchup that we're all really looking forward to yeah. and i say it's an mma fight but we all know jiu-jitsu is going to break out diego lopez versus brian t city yeah. ortega that's going to be a very close entertaining fight as well and Feature then finish belt. things up you know touching on the very impressive performance that sean brady just had against gilbert burns in what was an ultra exciting super fast paced fight but I want to start with the fight that we're all most excited about oh, this yeah. weekend, and that is the Bantamweight Championship fight, the great stylistic matchup of the tall, slender, powerful striker in Sean O'Malley and the absolute cardio wrestling machine of Marab Dvalish. Really, I'm really excited to break down this matchup because I think and I want to talk about how both men can win this fight because it is a winnable fight for both men. Obviously, we're going to make predictions and pick one way or the other. But let's start with Marab. What, in your opinion, does Duvalish really need to do to really stay away from that power that he, I think, is susceptible to getting cracked by and utilize his best skill set, which is the cardio and the wrestling, to beat Sean O'Malley? Yeah, well, that's a great question. And Marab, obviously, on a 10-fight win streak, he's been waiting for his opportunity to get a, a title shot. And he, the only reason he hasn't got one sooner is because his friend was the champion up until recently. So... He's obviously got to wrestle. And, you know, back in the day, we could say this is a striker versus wrestler matchup. Nowadays, it's a little harder to see those because everybody's so good everywhere. And I'm not saying Marab's not a good striker, and I'm not saying Sugar Sean is not a great grappler, but this one is as close to a wrestler or a grappler versus a striker match that you're going to see in the UFC. It also happens to be the highest level of MMA possible, which makes it very interesting because regardless of the path that you took to get to the UFC and then get to the belt, uh, if, as long as you come with some sort of dominant uh, style, some sort of discipline that you've really cra uh, honed the craft to, whether it's Sugar Sean striking and the, the innovative things he's doing, or Marab's tenacious wrestling that's so good that you know Henry Cejudo found himself on the back on his back several times in their fight. What whatever your style is, whatever it does that it is that makes you work, and I don't think it's just down to your skills. I think it's down to the body type. Sugar Sean's the long rangy striker that knows how to use every inch of his of his reach and 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 keep his shorter opponents away from him. He's had a lot of experience doing that, being such a tall 135er. And Marab knows how to get inside on guys. He's usually got a, a height deficit against most of the people he's fighting, and he still knows how to find his way inside. His striking, you know, he does get him caught from time to time on the uh, on the entries, but. He's so tenacious, he's very tough and durable that he can take a couple shots to get into where he wants it. And once he does do that, he has a way of zapping your, your gas tank, killing your cardio, all the while seems to be picking up steam. It's almost like he takes it from you and gives it to himself, and that's how he gets this unlimited gas <laughs> He tank. recharges his batteries with your uh, deficit. Right, he's like a Tesla and yeah. you're a supercharger <laughs> station, so he's stealing all your, all your energy. And... He's so good at winning rounds. He's so good at taking the fight where he wants to do it. But Sugar Sean, most people say uh, he's not a great grappler. We haven't seen that much. And the reason you haven't seen much grappling out of Sugar Sean is because he's so lethal with his hands. He's so good on the feet. He doesn't have to entertain that. And the same sort of thing that happened with Israel Adesanya that everybody started to see is like, okay, we can't stand and strike with this guy, so let's get him to the ground. But he's been working this insane takedown defense up against the cage, out in the open, everywhere he's really polished. And Sugar Sean's done the same thing. And when you're dealing with these types of guys, they're operating on such a, a high frequency and they're so skilled and, and good with their bodies already that learning these techniques just comes very naturally to them and they pick up on it quickly. They start innovating, adding new wrinkles into their game. So Marab really does have to, to press the pressure. He has to push the gas on, on Sugar Sean. And I think before the last fight, people would probably say Sugar doesn't have much of a chance if it goes past the third round with Barab. 
But the, his pacing and his timing in his last two fights, especially the last one, was just a thing of beauty. He really knows yeah. how to how to push put the pressure on you, keep you know uh, hit an offensive attack on you without throwing volume constantly, because no human body can do that for twenty five straight minutes. But he knows how to pressure without throwing everything, and then of course he knows how to put the shots on you at the right times. And we saw that even in the championship rounds of his last fight, he was very poised, very collected, and seemed to have a lot of gas. So if if Marab wants to win this fight, he's got to zap the energy and he's got to do it with the grappling because everybody knows grappling is the most exhausting thing you can do in MMA. And hopefully, uh, if Marab's able to get him down, he can exhaust him on the ground because, uh, as we know, the judges see the person on the bottom as losing the fight. So the urgency that you have in MMA to get off of the ground and get back to your feet or at least get to the top position of the grappling exchange is essential. You have to know how to get there quickly and you'll exhaust yourself trying to do it. So Sugar Sean's got to avoid that. It, and it's, it's an interesting fight for many reasons, but I think the, the wrestler versus grapple, uh, the striker versus grappler situation is alive and well in this one. Yeah, I totally agree with that. And I have this kind of similar assessment with a few uh, caveats yeah. to it. So Marab, 100%, it's no secret that he's got to get Sean O'Malley to the ground. He cannot trade with him on the feet and think he's going to have any success of winning this right. fight. We've seen him cracked against everybody else on the way to Yeah, show. Henry Cejudo cracked him, and Henry Cejudo's, a, you know, for all intents and purposes, a 125-er. Marab Duwalish, really, if he has an Achilles heel, it's that he's not the cleanest striker. Right. And that's because he grew up wrestling. And, you know, a lot of times they talk about you know, and I was listening, this is kind of off topic, but listening to Andrew Huberman the other day okay. talk about building central nervous systems. And when strikers and grapplers are training from a young age, they almost form their central nervous system around that particular skill set, which I kind of, right. I, I like to nerd out on those little things. And that's yeah. why he said, you know, if you start striking at 25 years old, you start wrestling at 25 years old, you can get to a high level, but you can't get to the most elite level against the guys who have that ingrained in their body from the times their bodies and brains were developing. Yeah. And that's what Marab has when it comes to wrestling. He has that fully ingrained in him. He can do it without even thinking twice. But with striking, he has to kind of think about what he's going to do, think about the setups that he wants to kind of try to read the shots, but sometimes against a lethal striker like Sean, it, when you're trying to get a read, it's already too late because you're getting hit with the shot that you were trying to read. Right. So he's got to get it to the ground. But Marab doesn't get you to the ground and then submit you like Aljo did or like, you know, another really lethal grappler. Marab is a decision guy. We have to call a spade a spade. Now, he dominates people, don't get yeah. me wrong, but he wins most fights by decision. I think 85-plus percent of his fights in the UFC have been won via decision. And so I think he needs to do more than get the fight to the ground. He needs to do damage to Sean O'Malley when he's on the ground. Right. And I'm talking damage that disrupts what Sean's able to do at the beginning of the, pre of, the, of, the, of the following round. So what do I mean by that? Black his eye, blur his vision a little bit, break his nose with some, some strikes and some ground and pound, throw some elbows, yeah. not only zap the gas tank, because Sean's going to come into this fight very well conditioned. Against Cheeto Vera, he looked extraordinarily conditioned, and I expect this to be no different. When you're going up against Marab Dewalish Willie, and you're as seasoned of a champion as O'Malley is, and you have Tim Welch in your corner, trust me, no stone was left unturned when it comes to cardio. Right. So I expect Sean's cardio to not be at Marab's level, but it's going to be pretty damn good coming yeah. into this fight so what does marab have to do yes he has to get he has to to drain that cardio but he needs to do damage because if marab wins this fight if he is to win very likely it comes via decision yeah he's for sure not going to knock sean o'malley out and he's probably not going to submit him that's just not his game right he has to do it winning round over round and the only way and every round starts back again on the feet and so that's five opportunities at minimum. Even if Sean gets taken down and held down from the beginning of the round, he has a minimum of five opportunities to crack you on the feet. And what we've seen from O'Malley against lesser strikers is he doesn't even need five opportunities sometimes. Right. He just needs a couple of good looks. So I think Marab needs to, in rounds one, two, and, and probably three, 
do some damage on the ground. It's yeah. not just laying and praying is not the way to win this fight no. because Sean's not, it's not going to gas Sean. He'll concede the round. He's a smart guy. He'll keep himself safe. He'll get up, live to fight another round and try to knock you out in the next round. And right. he's got several, several opportunities to do it. So Marab needs to really focus on the damage. He needs to do things that are going to disrupt Sean's abilities to strike when he is given those other opportunities. And as I said, it's going to be a minimum of five, but in all likelihood, it's probably going to be 10 to 15 right. or more. If And that's, that's you know, assuming that Marab's able to get a takedown in every round. So I think that... I think really um, when it is on the feet with Sean, he needs to be mindful of the distance. He is going to get pieced up if he's at the end of Sean's jab yeah. because Sean's got those beautiful low kicks. He's got some great body kicks. He, he works a teep really well. And then obviously the bread and butter of that one too. I mean, yeah. he's got one of the cleanest straight punching games in the entire Bantamweight division, probably in, in the entire UFC. So Marab needs to smother him. He yeah. needs to make it like a Mike Tyson, you know, get Get inside, duck under, actually yeah. use your your height disadvantage to actually maybe make it an advantage right. by getting inside because Sean's not known to be this Muay Thai guy who's got this incredible clinch with elbows and stuff like that. He's a rangy long fighter. And the last thing I'll say for Marab when it does come to the feet, don't allow Sean to, to cut angles because yeah. the way that you're able to get away from a wrestler who's pressuring forward is cutting angles and then you know turning position on them where their back's against the cage now and you're safe from getting you know pinned against the cage and taken down. Right. That gets game can work both ways and if you know how to you know track your opponent and not chase your opponent you can keep them pinned so he's got to be really mindful of that don't let don't do all the work to get sean against the cage and then let him cut angle because he's going to be looking for that sean's not going to want to have his back against the cage with marab standing in front of him so you have to mitigate how how easily it is for sean to cut angles and if it becomes really easy for him then you're going to do all that work of backing him up and take the risk of having to close distance on Sean O'Malley for nothing, essentially. Right, right. And that's a great point. And Sean's very good at using every inch of the octagon. And if he needs to fight on the outside and keep you at bay the whole time, he'll do it. But doing that against somebody that's tracking you and, and constantly blocking you off and cutting your corners, uh, that, that's more difficult than somebody that's chasing you. And a lot of times, even at the highest level, you'll see somebody forget about that and they start chasing. And you realize they're not con controlling the center of the octagon at all. They're just following the person. Right. And a good counter striker, a long rangy striker like Sean can, can kind of just put you, uh, piece you apart the entire fight if that's what you're going to do. Marab's smart. He knows not to do that kind of stuff. Uh, but one thing I will say, because you've got me thinking about it with the, the height disadvantage, and that's a great point. But Marab is such a high-level grappler. And there's, there's a couple of things. I want you to, to follow me on this. So everybody knows Marab is a great wrestler. He needs to get inside. He needs to, to, to get a body lock. He needs to get to your legs. And he can usually get the job done from there. Uh, but, but getting there is, is harder. Uh, it's easier said than done. And Marab, just like a lot of wrestlers, loves to catch a kick and then, and then use that to get inside. If, you, if they can get a hold of one of your legs, they can get a hold of your body and then take you to the ground. So Sugar Sean, of course, everybody knows him because of his amazing highlight reels and just the in, insane uh, variety that he's able to throw. They're like, oh, man, he's great with his hands, and, uh, but his kicks are insane. And I will agree, his kicks are, are just as impressive as his hands. But one thing that's really impressive about Sean O'Malley is depending on who he's fighting, he decides when he's going to take what weapons out. And a lot of times, if he's fighting a wrestler or somebody who's, who's really tenacious for the takedown or, or to close distance, he will s avoid some of those kicks. He'll avoid some of the more flashy, uh, interesting spinning moves and, and high kicks and head kicks and stuff. And he'll, he'll put, put those in in a tasteful way. He won't overdo them. Uh, you can't give a guy like Marab Dualish Willie or anybody in the top five of a UFC division uh, any more than about two or three looks as to what you're going to do. If they, if you throw a head kick and they block it, uh, it, basically that tells you, okay, that head kick's not available for me right now. I got to do some more work elsewhere before I can look for that again. And Marab Duals really only needs one or two, uh, uh, reads to understand what you're doing and how to avoid it. So I think Sean is going to win this fight mostly with his hands. And I think a, a key punch and a key weapon that he's going to use is an uppercut up the middle. Because when you're dealing with a wrestler, they do need to close the distance. They need to change levels and get inside. 
But the same thing can be said uh, for knees that was said with kicks. All a wrestler needs is your leg. So you don't want to risk being on one, knee, one leg, throwing your knee up the middle for something that might not land flush. Your uppercut can do the same job as your knee, and that way you still keep your solid base, you get both of your feet on the ground, and you can move laterally, you can sprawl, you can do what you need to do. Uh, and also, uh, after you throw the uppercut, it's kind of like a built-in frame. So you can start to, to use your hands to keep your, your opponent at bay without having to use your kicks. And then, of course the gas tank will come into play. And I'm interested to see who's going to be more gassed at the end of this fight. My money would be on Sugar Sean, but after his last fight, we saw how good uh, uh, and, and, and poised he was all the way into the very end of the fight. And that's because he was doing what he likes to do. If, if you give Sean 25 minutes to go out there and strike with somebody and hit him like a heavy bag, he can do that all day long, no problem. If you make him get up off the ground time and time again, that's going to be a little bit more exhausting. And the same thing can be said for Marab. Marab has built up his cardio to be really good in the grappling world. But if you're getting tagged constantly on the feet and you can't find your way inside, then your shots get a little more telegraphed. It's a little bit easier to see your entries. Your punching and your striking gets a little bit more desperate, and that leaves you susceptible to more counter striking that Sugar Sean's so good at, and you can't risk getting hit by. So I, I think Marab, the, the, his way to get inside is actually going to be a little bit more complex because Sugar Sean, it, like you said, he's with one of the best coaches in the game right now. And I know he's young, but Tim Welch is doing yeah. a lot of great things. And, and Sugar seems to be the mastermind who's, who's got a perfect sidekick. That just they've, they've got the formula. It works for them, and they don't need to, to change much. But what they're doing game plan-wise, like, okay, we're fighting a wrestler. Let's avoid some of these kicks. Your hands are good enough to keep them at bay, and that keeps your base and, and, and everything uh, – uh, on the feet. That's very important. So I look for Sugar Sean to win this fight, mostly with his hands, a lot of great combinations. Uh, once he starts to open Marab up, he's going to look for some more finishing blows, but I think he's going to try to zap Marab's uh, energy, his ability to fight, and, and probably, you know, bruise him up and bang him up a little bit on the face to, to slow Marab's roll down. And I think by the end of this fight, we could see Marab look like the more gassed fighter as far as technique goes and his ability to implement his game plan. So uh, I say that to tell you, I believe Sugar Sean will win this fight. I think it's actually going to be a knockout. I think yeah. Marab is going to put up a good fight. He'll probably win a round or two in the early parts. And I think Sugar Sean is going to have to deal with a lot of adversity in this fight. We're going to see some things we have never seen from him. I think we're going to see a lot of time uh, uh, of him on the ground, but we're going to see some, some, some good calmness down there. We're going to see some good techniques. We're going to realize he's not just some good striker, but I do think ultimately he's going to keep the fight on the feet long enough to find a knockout. I think he's going to do it with his hands. We'll see a little bit of flash come out if he starts to get Marab rocked or dazed a little bit, but he'll stick with his bread and butter, his clean, crisp striking, his, his boxing primarily, and I think he gets the job done probably round four TKO. Well, perfect. So my next tee up was going to be what does Sean need to do to win the fight, but you just went ahead and carried that on. So I'll, come, yeah, yeah. I'll give my thoughts and then, ultimate, and then give my prediction as well. Um, so a couple of thoughts about what Sean needs to do specifically to win the fight. And it's easy to just say all the opposite things of what I said he, Marab needs to do to him. Don't allow that to happen to yourself. Right. The uppercut is something that I was thinking as well. I was also thinking knee, but as you were giving the reasons why the knee probably wouldn't be the best tool, and Sean is so good with those uppercuts and he can catch them, if the uppercut's landing and that's keeping Marab at bay, there really is no need to take that risk of, of doing a jump knee or throwing just a straight knee up the middle because you're you know, compromising your position even if it's just for a split second. Marab may even read that and say, you know what, I'm just going to bite down eat this knee, hope it hits my chest so it slows down before it hits my face. You know, one of those things, because I'm right. just going to grab him and, and take him down from there. But the and, even, and even rest on the bottom, on the ground once he gets there, if, if it does take a lot out of him. Right. And not to cut you off, yeah. but a knee is actually a far shorter strike. It requires a closer range than a kick. And if, if Marab can catch a kick on people, which he's done successfully throughout his whole career, he can certainly catch a knee as well. So yeah. I think... Uh, uh, that's the main reason why I don't see that happening. I think the uppercut's the safer move for Sugar Sean, at least at first. Yeah, and I think as far as kicking is concerned, he needs to keep the kick game low. 
Yeah. Um, you know, damage the legs of a wrestler. Yeah, that's fair game. Nobody, you shouldn't try to catch a calf kick. If right. you do, and and Sean is a good enough striker to read that, he will take the chance of throwing a head kick because if he can get you to think a calf kick's coming or a a low quad kick's right. coming, and you're gonna and he sees that your tendency is to reach down and grab for it, he may roll the dice and try to shut your lights out with a head kick, which you know is very po- possible. But I think the to- the kick should be utilized to slow down the entries because Sean's going to have a hard time defending all the takedowns. Yeah. He's probably going to get taken down a time or two. How do you slow down the entries of a wrestler? Yeah, you crack them with stuff up the middle, good uppercuts, good straight punches and cutting angles. But if you can deaden the machine, which is the legs, which gets you from point A to point B, you can't do any wrestling or close any distance without your legs. Right. So if you can make those a little bit heavy and, and, and you know they're bruising a little bit, the circulation not really flowing like how it was in the beginning of the fight. That's a key element to be to having success. Don't throw a lot of the body kicks because, right. as you said, Marab's really good at catching those and then off balancing you, sweeping the other leg and ending up on top of you. Avoid push kicks and teep kicks too because those yeah. are the same thing. He can catch them right there from the from the inside. Exactly. So so I think Sean's kick game needs to be low. I think that he needs to really um, try his best to maintain frame, maintain base, and not end up on his back. Really fight for position when Marab does have him against the cage. Clinch, don't just concede a takedown and say, oh, I'll, you know, wait for the next round. Because if Marab does some of the stuff that I was talking about, you know, and trying to do damage, if he is able to, you know, get a cut. We've seen some weird things happen. Right. This is happening in Vegas, so the doctors and the referees and all are, are seasoned, they but yeah. if he can if he can split Sean open or, or do something like that, it's not going to bode well for O'Malley in the later rounds as, as things go along. So really don't just concede the takedown. Really fight to defend it, right. which is easier said than done um, with a fighter like Marab. But I think also the key thing for Sean here is going to be a little bit of patience because he, we know that Marab's going to come from the first moment. But if you start to land on him with good patient strikes, you're, you're calculated, boom, you land an uppercut when he comes in and that frazzles him. And then he tries to close distance and one, two, you crack him again. He's going to start to get a little bit desperate for the shot. And what did we see when Sean fought Aljo? We saw Aljo completely abandon what looked like all technique and just kind of run in on Sean. Right. And that set him up for the perfect finisher or the, what set up the finish. Ultimately, the ground and pound was what got the job done. But that shot, on the feet is yeah. what started the party. So definitely he needs to look for Marab to come in sloppy. Yeah. And so if you can start to irritate him on your entries and start to crack him a few times, he may take kind of a half-assed shot. And if he does that, that's where Sean's opportunity to land the real power is going to be. So I right. think patience and shot selection is going to be key for Sean. And I think he's going to choose the right ones. I'm picking Sean by TKO third round. Okay, so we got a pretty so, similar yeah. similar call. Similar prediction. So let's move on now to the co-main event. Okay. Valentina Shevchenko, Alexa Grasso, also a great stylistic match, but honestly these ladies are both good everywhere. Yeah. We talked about, you know, being in a discipline since you were a kid. I don't think it gets any more uh, ingrained in somebody's brain is striking than it does for Valentina the Bullet Shevchenko. Seriously. She's as clean as they come, not just for females, but her technique is as good as anybody's, yeah. really and truly. Alexa Grasso is the new generation of MMA fighters. Right. You can't find a weak spot in Alexa's game. You want to go to the ground, she can submit you. You want to stay on the feet, she's got some great clean boxing and good hands. Right. Alexa's 2-0 and against Val, and let's you know get the elephant out of the room first. Valentina Shevchenko's 36, almost 37 years old. Right. The 35 curse is a real thing for everybody 170 and below, including the ladies. She's been beaten twice by Alexa. This is a hard fight for Valentina, but yeah. I think it's winnable. So I think the perfect place to start the the conversation is because I think Alexa is the favorite, a small favorite. Yeah. What does Valentina do to get her belt back against a fighter who she's lost to twice, albeit the last one was very close? Yeah, I had the last one going towards Valentina, and you know I'm sure you know I'll get a little pushback on that, but it was a close fight regardless, and yes. Alexa definitely had great moments in it. Um, but I think Valentina is going to come in with a chip on her shoulder. And we've always known Valentina to be an aggressive type. And the ladies, she's kind of like the boogeyman of the ladies' yeah. divisions, of all of them. And so when she goes out there, there's this aura around her. And most of the time, these ladies uh, are, are 
realize they've lost the fight before it's even started. Yeah. Alexa Grasso is not like that, and she's really able to to hang with her in every realm. You know, most of the time when you see a girl who's got a, a, a good grappling game or a wrestling game, they'll look to take Valentina down. And time and time again, for the past several years, we've seen girls do that and then wind up getting tossed on their head when they go in for their entry because it's some sort of beautiful judo uh, uh, reversal that yeah. turns into a toss, and then Valentina winds up submitting them or something. You know, yeah. you can- shout out to our jujitsu coach, Professor Draculino. He yeah. uh, Valentina, when she first moved to the states, I don't think a lot of people know she spent a lot of time at Gracie yeah. Baja, Texas. Yeah, and, right here yeah. in the south part of Houston. Honed yeah. her, honed her grappling game because every she was a you know lights out elite striker yeah. but professor drack really helped her um you know round out that game so so shout out to him yeah absolutely and yeah. and so she's as complete of a yeah. fighter as we've seen especially in the the female divisions and i think that grasso knows okay I've, I've beaten this girl before she is the boogeyman and i i respect her skills and what she's done in the sport but it's my time now so i i, I don't think we're going to see a lot of conceding i don't think alexa grasso feels like she lost that last fight so she feels like she's the girl that's two and oh against this girl that was the most feared woman in, in the sport for a long time and valentina's just going to be angry about that because she felt like she was robbed in that last fight yeah. and i don't agree fully with her but i did think she won the fight so I think Valentina's obviously got to keep this fight striking. Don't be afraid to go to the ground because she's she's very good down there too. And I'm I don't think she has to worry about getting submitted the second it goes to the ground. I think she's able to yeah. to scramble and grapple with Grasso, and she might even want to show us a little bit of that. She's kind of cocky in that way where she's like, "Oh, you're going to give me a, a, a judo master? Well, I'm going to toss them on their head. You're going to give me a submission ace? Well, then I'm going to submit them. You give me a great striker, I'm going to I'm going to piece them up." So she's really good at doing that, but it's it's one of those ones where if I'm her coach, I'm like, just just, just do what you do. What's going to win you the yeah, freaking fight? Yeah, yeah, find the hole in their game yeah. and go exploit it because yeah. you're good everywhere. But no, she likes to to entertain the crowd, and uh, you know, I, I guess the 35 curse is something you probably shouldn't bet against if you're if you're going strictly off numbers. But I'm not uh, betting on this fight, and I do think <laughs> Valentina's going to win. I think she won the last one. I think she's going to be really angry this time. She's going to come with vengeance. And uh, Grasso's a great fighter. I think her, her she'll wind up getting the belt right back. I don't think we need to see a fourth fight between these girls. No. Valentina's shelf life is expiring, and you know we'll probably see her in there maybe three to five more times. That's that's my you guess. You think that many? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I don't really see her sticking around a whole lot longer. But yeah. if she wins this fight, it makes sense for her to do a couple more. And I think... Grasso will wind up getting her belt right back, and then she probably won't get beat for a long time. But something just doesn't feel right about Valentina going 0-3 in her last three, or 0-2 even. It doesn't even feel yeah. right to see her lose. And I know neither girl has has done anything since the last one, but they didn't have to do anything. The, the division needs to settle itself, yeah. and there's clearly two juggernauts in the division that have to settle their differences before we move on. And, uh, yeah, it's the right fight, great fight. Grasso's going to be fighting you know, in front of... The, the Spheres crowd, the first ever uh, uh, fighting situation, combat sports show in the Sphere for uh, Mexican Independence Day. It's going to be very cool for her. I think it's going to be a fun moment, but uh, unfortunately, I think Valentina is going to spoil the, the fun for the Mexican fans and Valent- uh, Alexa Grasso. I think Valentina gets it done, but probably by decision. Nice. Well, in the spirit of college football starting and watching college game day yesterday, I'll pull one Hit out of me. Lee Corso's playbook. Not so fast. There it is. Alexa Grasso is going to win this fight. And oh, I'm yeah. going to tell you why. Valentina is going to have a chip on her shoulder, and she's going to be very difficult to beat. She's yeah. always very difficult to beat. But this fight is happening on Mexican Independence Night. Yeah. Whether and, and Valentina said very clearly after the last fight, the reason Alexa won is because the judges gave it to her because it happened on a Mexican holiday. Now, do I agree with that? No. But that tells me that Valentina believes that. Yeah. And she's coming into this fight thinking, you know, this is Noche UFC. Right. This is, Dana White said himself, this is going to be a, quote, love fest to the Mexican people. Right. Well, the champion just so happens to be Mexican. And she's very likable. And, right. and Valentina, and, and she's the new era of of female fighters yeah so in valentina's mind she's got to be thinking i need a finisher i'm gonna get robbed again right and i think that she may get a touch reckless yeah and also the 35 year old curse is there it really plagues the lower weight classes we saw Bilal just you know kind of thwart yeah. that curse it's once so the statistic is 170 and below 185 plus it doesn't affect it that much but 170 and below if you're over the age of 35 fighting to win a title especially as the challenger you're like 
two and, and 36 or yeah. something. It's, it's a really ridiculous number. Like more than 95% of the time you lose. And Alexa Grasso, she's the new breed of MMA fighters. Yeah. She's come up in the world of MMA. She wasn't a specialist here like Mackenzie Dern that is trying to put striking together later or right. Valentina that, you know, developed a grappling game and then came into her own as a really elite level mixed martial artist. Right. Alexa Grasso from the jump in the UFC has yeah. been an elite level mixed martial artist. And so I think she'll be able to stay poised. She's got a lot of confidence. Yeah. She's a she's a very likable young lady. And Valentina, if make if she makes any mistakes, Alexa's going to capitalize on them. And yeah. I think Valentina is going to come just a touch too aggressive, which I think is going to allow Alexa to start to really get her her ground game going yeah. and and start to to hit her with some shots as well on the feet. But ultimately, I, I like Alexa by submission again. Yeah, and I think I, I think rear naked choke probably wow. third fourth round sometime mid fight is when it's going to happen. But um, Valentina is going to make a, a mistake that she doesn't come back from because she's really eager to get that finish, and Alexa's going to capitalize on it. And still, Alexa Grasso. Wow. Well, you're right about that. You know, Alexa Grasso's maybe her best position is taking the back on somebody. She's so good there. Yeah. And Valentina has been in that position many times, and. Uh, usually isn't even sweating when she's back there. But when Valentina, uh, when Alexa's on her back, sorry, their names are so close. Yeah. <laughs> when Alexa's on her back, there's some serious uh, risk there. You have to you have to really watch what you're doing. So I think she's got to avoid it. And uh, what you're saying about the recklessness, it reminds me of the last fight because when you're watching Valentina, who's such a technician, she's so crisp and clean and always putting on clinics. When you see her throwing some shots that are a little bit more wild, a little bit less technical than what we're used to seeing out of her, you're like, oh man, she's really affected by what Alexa's bringing to her. It does start to make you wor worry about, uh, you know, if she overextends on a two and steps with it and Alexa winds up, you know, doing a slight arm drag, taking the back. And then of course the grappling starts from there and Alexa seems to always be one step ahead, as, at least in the two fights that we've seen. She's always one step ahead of Valentina when it comes to the s submission side and the submission threats of their grappling exchanges. Valentina does great on the ground and pound. She had some great moments from the top positions in their last fight. But when it comes down to you know, scrambling when it comes down to the wrestling to switch to wrestling into positions that will lead to submissions. Yeah. Uh, Valentina isn't quite at the same level as Alexa, and that's where she's got to watch out. I'm with you. I think if she follows the same sort of playbook as Sugar Sean, keep this thing long, keep it rangy, strike when you need to, and 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 make Alexa Grasso get a little bit desperate, make her feel the crowd that she's there to, that, that's on her back, make her feel the big moment, all the pressure everything's on you. You're the champion. So if she can make the big moment affect Alexa Grasso a little bit and make Alexa abandon game plan, maybe by even causing it to be a little bit boring. If I was Valentina's corner, I'd say, look, let's, she's there to entertain her crowd. There's going to be some feelings of, I want to get this girl out of there. Let's make it a slow paced fight. Let's make it a little bit boring, get the crowd going crazy. And then she might try to do something out of character of the game plan that they devised leading into this fight. And that's where we'll have our opportunities. And once you have somebody abandoning game plan, plan just a little bit, they'll do it all night long. And then there's, there's holes. Yeah. You start to realize where the boat has its holes and it's starting to sink. And uh, Valentina really does need to control the pace. I think the best chance she has to win this fight is to control the pace. Alexa seemed to do that in the majority of the rounds that they've fought so far. But uh, I still think Valentina is going to get the job done. It's going to be a razor close fight. I've got a decision. Could be split decision, but I think three rounds or four rounds are going to go Valentina's way. Nice. And now uh, the the matchup that we're both yeah. really looking forward to. The I mean, feature bout. We've had this one circled for a while. It was supposed to happen. It yeah. fell through. Uh, Diego Lopez versus Brian Ortega. Great. Now, I'm just going to go ahead and tell you, I as good at jiu-jitsu as both of these gentlemen are, I actually don't think this fight's going to end in a submission because I no. think that the jiu-jitsu levels that both of these men are at are going to kind of cancel each other out in yeah. a way which to me is scary for Brian Ortega if you're a T-City fan because Diego Lopez has got some firepower, man. Right. He's got that it factor. He's fun. He's a, he, Every time he steps into the octagon, you don't know what you're going to see, but you know you're going to like it. Right. And so I'll just, I won't even bury the lead. I think Diego's going to win. Wow. Um, but I think that he's going to get it done on the feet because Brian, his best moments in the UFC have all come on the ground. Yeah. T-City, yeah. 
His striking has evolved a little bit over time. He's but, had some nice knockouts. You know, but. we've seen. You know, we saw Max Holloway famously put his hands up. He's like, dude, you know, at least if I'm going to punch your face, put your hands up. So it's a little bit, a you know, difficult to, to to work around the guard. But you know, Diego Lopez has got some real power. Yeah, he's very brash. He's very exciting on the feet as well as an excellent jujitsu game. But even if Brian does get him to the ground, Diego's so good from bottom position. Right. His scrambles and wrestling up is is excellent. I don't think Brian's going to be able to pin him down and do what he needs to do to advance position to either a back take or to mount, right. which is where he kind of needs to be. Yes, he's T City, but what are the chances that he submits Diego Lopez from the back? You know, submitting, I mean, this is not. 1993 this is not the early 2000s anymore submitting people from the back in mma is almost impossible especially somebody like diego lopez at this point you have to really have somebody hurt or you know they make a very careless mistake if you're going to catch them in a triangle or an arm bar from bottom position or something like that so i think brian if he is to submit diego needs to get to mount and then transition to the back which i just can't see him doing against a wiry explosive you know grappling ace like lopez so i'm gonna pick lopez to win this fight on the feet i think either a decision or third round knockout but i think diego lopez gets it done on the feet because brian's not able to work his jujitsu game okay great prediction but i will tell you this i see this fight ending in either both guys getting a 50k bonus or one of them getting a a performance bonus because both of them are great starters diego lopez comes out there and within a minute or two you're his opponent's usually unconscious yeah right so it's he's very exciting but he starts fast and ortega even though he's known as the grappling guy he's zen he's mr cool he's calm and collected all that stuff he is a great starter as well he comes out looking to scrap and he is a brawler like he'll he will absolutely abide to striking with diego and i think that will be a mistake i'm kind of leaning with you in that uh t T city is a a a grappler and a jujitsu first guy but he's not a ryan hall that that you know goes broke for the takedown he's he's he will fight you on your feet and he'll do just fine up there but when the time comes and he needs to either shoot or you get a little too close, he can he can change things very quickly. And his grappling, especially his sub- submissions, have been you know you know documented well. Yeah. He's very very good on the ground. But he's kind of like what we we're talking about with the with the female fighters. Uh, Alexa came up in the MMA realm and the era of people learning MMA from from the beginning. Valentina and 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 people like uh, uh, T City. They came up under a discipline, and then they learned other things, and that's their base. But they're they're good everywhere else. Make no mistake, I'm not saying T City is only good at jujitsu. He's good everywhere, yeah. very good, and has been for a long time. But uh, the 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 grappling that Diego Lopez is doing is the modern grappling. I don't. He's not even old enough to have been in the game. It's jujitsu modified for MMA. Yeah, it's hard to even call it jujitsu because if you go to a, a great jujitsu program if you go anywhere in, in the country that's got their hand on the pulse of the game and they've, they've got high level fighters in there you go to their jujitsu class and then take the 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 no gi grappling for mma class that, that happens right after it not only is it a completely different class it's a different pace and there's different terminology there is quite yeah. literally terms that you don't know if you only do jujitsu versus if you do uh mma grappling and of course i'm not saying t city doesn't know this terminology i'm not I'm right, saying, right. trying to say that but uh, the, the grappling style of these young guys, and Diego Lopez is one of them, it's wiry, it's great, uh, it's great scrambles, it's great reversals, it's all these sorts of uh, uh, use, uses of momentum. You know, it's, it's very much like the Aikido or Judo way, like bring, bring somebody's momentum towards you and then redirect them. But these grapplers are starting to do it on the ground and stuff, and they know, okay, if, I, if, if I'm starting to get taken down, there's some sort of role I can do. And it's just progressing at this crazy rate. But these guys like Diego Lopez are really, really uh, excelling quickly in this new form of yeah. grappling. And there's great submissions that all came from jujitsu that exist inside of that grappling. And there's great wrestling that gets modified a little bit. But these MMA grapplers are, are very difficult to, to get out of there. I'd say 80... I, I'm, I, there's a stat. You can get the exact number. But it's about 88% of all submissions in MMA in the UFC right now 
come from rear naked chokes. So you have yeah. to basically get the back. People aren't tapping to arm bars much these days. They're not, you know, heel hooks and stuff are, are more used for reversals and to get back on top or get back to your feet. So there's not a whole lot besides getting to the back and choking somebody out that you can do to submit them. And, and like you said, I don't see T-City winding up uh, getting a triangle or getting a, you know, Oma Plata. He's not going to do something like that with Diego. It's too complex. But if he can get to the back, he can find the submission. I just don't think that's going to happen. I think we're going to see a lot of fun grappling. I think we're going to see some, uh, some fireworks on the feet. But if T-City goes out there and obliges and goes right into a, a firefight with Diego, which is what Diego is going to come out and do at, ver- at the very beginning, he could wind up uh, on the canvas in the first couple minutes of the fight. I'm leaning towards that happening, but if it doesn't happen, we're going to get fight of the night where we see about seven and a half minutes on the ground, seven and a half minutes on the feet. Everybody's landing some great stuff, and it's a it's a it's a, a razor ha- close a razor here. close exactly a razor close decision. It could go either way, but I honestly think there's going to be some electricity in the in the air that night. We've got Diego Lopez, who's a, a Mexi- uh, proud Mexican guy with Brazilian heritage as well, and T-City, who's a proud Mexican guy with, who was born in America. So it's going to be a fun fight, but I do have Diego Lopez coming in and uh, sort of sta- taking T-City's stamp at the top of 145 and sort of moving into what what will be title talks pretty soon. Yeah, I, I see Diego Lopez being a guy on the short list for title shots yeah. after this fight. Oh, um, yeah. I'm, I'm super excited to watch it. So let's wrap up on the uh, fight that just happened, talking yeah. about MMA grapplers. You know, great fight. Sean Brady, someone who has defeated Craig Jones in Jiu Jitsu. Insane. In no gi Jiu Jitsu. So you have to understand, for those that don't know, how, how impressive that actually right. is. Craig is one of the best no gi Jiu Jitsu players on planet Earth. Right. And Sean was able to to beat him in their little um, UFC Fight Pass exhibition. That goes a little bit did. with what I was saying with the the fight, Diego yeah. Lopez and T City. We've got a great submission ace versus a guy who's a wrestler and a grappler. And and uh, oddly enough, Craig Jones can submit anybody, but right. I guess he could. But not Sean Brady. Brady. Yeah. yeah, crazy. But here's the thing, though. Sean looks re- really really good on the feet too. Yeah, his the pace was insane. You know, we didn't yeah. know Sean with that big frame, that big body. Uh, you know, some of these bigger muscular guys have a hard time going five rounds. They have a hard time with cardio. Right. That was not the case. His strength looked incredible. His cardio looked incredible. Obviously, we know his grappling's incredible. Gilbert's an ADCC veteran, and he kind of got thrown around. And uh, Gilbert certainly had his moments. Yeah. But here's the two things that stuck out to me for Sean and why I think this is a new... The post Bilal Muhammad loss, Sean Brady, is a new fighter. Yeah. One, durability. Gilbert landed some big knees up the middle, some Huge. jump knees, some really powerful hooks, and Gilbert sat Hams out on his knees. You know yeah. what I mean? So Gilbert's no nobody to, to mess around with when it comes to getting cracked by him. He's a real lethal striker, no. and he's a top level jujitsu player. Was you know ADCC veteran, then came into the UFC. Right. Also has some phenomenal grappling. Um, Sean ate his best shots and kept coming forward. Right. And then on top of that, we have to talk about his striking. He looked cleaner than he's ever looked, and that was the part of his game that I really thought he needed to clean up if he was going to make one more run or make a, another run yeah. towards, the, towards the top of uh, 170. So to me, all good takeaways for Sean. I wanted to see cardio. I wanted to see durability, and I wanted to see striking improvements, and I saw all of that. Yeah, I wanted to see how he would come back after suffering that loss because when you're a guy who's got 15 or 16 wins and you've never lost, and I mean, he lost to Bilal Muhammad, so right. who, who proved to us that he's the best fighter in the world uh, in their division. So nothing to scoff about. He shouldn't be upset that he lost that fight. I think he should be looking at potentially getting another one this time for yeah. for some gold on the line. Uh, and Sean Brady, after that performance, I think he is a top contender. I, I don't think if they put him in a title shot next, people would bat an eye. And look, it's so funny when you when you read the internet because you got to go to the comments. Of course, now everybody's feed is full of Brady versus Gilbert. And then the comments are like, oh man, Gilbert's done. Gilbert's toast. He's old. All. I'm like, Gilbert could have won that fight probably 10 times. It, yeah. he, he was hitting uh, Sean Brady as hard as he possibly could. He, he was in that fight, and I know it was about a 50 to, to 45 or 49, 46 uh, card all the way through, and you couldn't really see any other case for anything else. 
But Gilbert Burns could have won all of those rounds. And also he could beat about every single 170 fighter on the roster except for maybe four or five. Right, exactly. So, you know, obviously Sean Brady, or uh, Sean Brady. Yeah. I I was Tom Brady, Sean Brady. (laughs) Uh, Sean Brady (laughs) won won every round. And and I, I wouldn't say that Gilbert stole any of them, but he had his moments in every one. So on paper, this fight looked like a blowout. But if you watched it, you were entertained from start to finish and you saw a lot of good moments from Gilbert. Uh, but Sean Brady showed that the, the evolution of the game is still uh, moving at a rapid pace. And I think Sean Brady really buttoned up a lot. You know, you see these guys who realize there's a deficit in their game and then they come back and you wonder if they, if they address those issues or, and, and half the time, or I'd say 90% of the time they do address the situation. 50% of the time they can actually do something about it. You know, right. it's like you were saying with the, the Huberman thing earlier. If you didn't teach your body to move a certain way from a very early age, it's very hard to do it. And that's why some wrestlers just can't strike. They, they'll they never be great strikers because they didn't move that way. Some some gr- strikers are never going to be that tenacious on the ground because they just aren't familiar with that, moving their body like that for, for, for decades. And uh, Sean Brady, clearly, obviously he's got great grappling, great wrestling, but... He realized there was a little deficit at 170 with all the great strikers in there uh, in his striking game, and he went out, and I don't know if he went to a boxing coach. I don't know if he's been you know, moving around uh, around the world to, to get better training or if he's just locked in with his guys and they've got a formula, but his striking looked really good. It complemented his wrestling game and his cage work perfectly. I don't think he needs Paul to Paul Felder do... said he's been working a lot with him in oh. the uh, post-fight show, which, well, I mean, Paul Felder's a great beast. striker. Yeah. People forget, you know, he's a commentator. He looks good on camera and everything like that, but he was a, a lethal striker he was known for his striking very good everywhere but he was known and uh sean brady showed us that uh, he's never going to be the sugar sean who's spinning and kicking and doing all this crazy stuff but he's got really solid power he's got nice fundamentals and he's setting up what he does best which is take the fight to good blitzes you know the the, the striking blitzes lead up to his grappling yeah yeah. really good inside leg kicks too he was landing those a lot yeah he looked great and you know he now he's in a division that's so hot there's several undefeated if not they've got one loss just like him undefeated guys who are very good strikers and there's they've got some steam on them yeah and he was one of the hot commodities about two years ago and then after he lost it kind of took a, a little bit of the steam away but after that performance last night you put him right in there with the Shavkat, the ian gary these the jack uh della madalena the, those guys are the future of the division yeah. and any way you match them up they can beat each other but i think sean brady if he can continue to improve his striking the way he's been improving it and then and then obviously get these fights to the ground and, and do what he does best with the overwhelming uh top pressure really really great grappling and top pressure uh followed by some great ground and pound he can find himself in a title shot real soon and i think you know Bilal muhammad you know he's he's a champion that you have to you have to love. I know a lot of people give him a lot, a lot of people of, don't love him. Oh yeah, <laughs> a lot of people want to forget his name, but yeah. he is remember the name. He's a champ, but he's a class act. You know, honestly, uh, as soon as the fight was over, they 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 announced who won the fight. Everybody knew it was going to be Sean Brady, and the first tweet that came out uh, was blue check mark Bilal Muhammad. It said, "Man, Sean Brady is going to be hard to beat," and he's already beat him one time. But that was a champ, not trolling. That wasn't a Conor McGregor style with with like a crying, laughing emoji at the end of it. That was like, "Oh man, there's a there's a contender here." And I thought yeah. I was past him, but if he keeps fighting like that, I'm going to see him again very soon. So, uh, props to him. I think it's cool that Bilal did that because these guys are. Uh, sort of in that era, like Bilal Muhammad to- brushes off a Conor McGregor conversation. He's like, I don't care if he wins two fights in my division. He's not getting a, a title shot because he doesn't deserve it. These guys that are undefeated for 18 yeah. fights, and they deserve that title shot. Sean Brady is just like that. And after uh, Bilal got past him one time, he's going to have to work even harder to get past him again. I think the, the future is bright for Sean Brady. He looked really good, and I think we're only going to see more and more improvements in his game. Agreed. And Clearly, to me, Shavkat's next. Shavkat yeah, versus um, Bilal needs to happen. Yeah. And, you know, Sean talked a lot of smack about Ian Gary. Those two clearly don't get it on. So, uh, you know, I think Ian, now with this new and improved striking, let's see how he holds up against Ian Gary because I think he's got a massive grappling and size advantage there. Yeah, and I'll hit you yeah. with one little piece of MMA math that was running through my brain as we were talking about this fight. Gilbert Burns and Sean Brady have a similar opponent now uh, in, in recent history, and that's uh, Gilbert uh, Gilbert Burns. Hamzat and Sean Brady both fought him, and I yeah. know it was a different fight because it was five rounds versus three rounds, but 
that was a far more impressive performance from Sean Brady than we got out of Hamzat. It was a razor close fight with Gilbert. Yeah. And this fight was a little bit less close. You know, I, it, like I said, Gilbert had his moments. But that made me wonder okay, I would have probably assumed if you asked me before that fight who would win a fight, Hamzat or Bilal Muhammad, I probably would go Hamzat. But then I see Gilbert Burns go out there and lose to Sean Brady and kind of get beat up. And I have to say, well, if, if Hamzat would beat him and Gilbert fought the same guy, Sean Brady, then you have to assume Sean Brady would probably beat him as well. And so it just made me like wish Hamzat was at 170 still so yeah. we could see some of those things. And I know we're, never, we're probably never going to get that, but it made me realize that you know Sean Brady deserves a lot of respect because I think the way he was able to go out there and beat Gilbert Burns, a guy who's a thorn in the side of everybody, proved to, that he's probably one, two, or number three best in the world. Very well said. I think that's a perfect place to end it. Thanks. Guys, thanks so much for watching. Enjoy Noche UFC. Comment your predictions below. Let us know who you think is winning all of the fights on the main card, and we will see you for the recap afterwards. Have a great day. Peace.